we're going to do a little bit of a speed round this morning um, to, to get us back into our theme and get us prepped for the workshop ahead, which is really thinking about purpose-driven brands. Um, and so I'm really excited to be a part of this panel discussion, thinking about what a purposeful brand does for how you create the most effective sales organization, how you create better connection to your brand and how you advise other companies to make better connections to their brand. So I want to start with you, Mike Gamson, who is, in the interest of full disclosure, is my boss's boss. Um, I'm not sure what that nervous laugh was. That means I'm, I'm a jerk in real life, and so whatever I'm about to do, I'm not sure what that is. By the way, he I'm still needs go, training, though. That's right. I'm just, guys, let's just go off script. I think we should do the whole thing. Should we take a page from the last book? I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that to you. <laughs> just kidding. I was ready to go, Mike. I mean, this is... Um, well, one of the things that um, really struck me when I joined LinkedIn was the emphasis on culture. And culture, actually, as a tenant that we use in the hiring process, that we enforce um, during the course of the work week in our review process. And you know, given that you run the global sales organization at LinkedIn that is so, at the end of the day, metrics driven, what is the role of culture and value in terms of how that drives ROI ultimately? You know, I, I think, well, I would encourage all of you to double check this with the LinkedIn person in your life uh, to make sure that this isn't just rhetoric coming from your boss's boss. But I think the culture is the very essence of what defines us. It's the thing that, you know, we sat in a room many years ago, eight, nine years ago, and said, we have this opportunity to start a team that can be about anything. What do we want it to be about? And at that starting place, it was about trying to create a series of ideas that would make us feel inspired to be there. I think like you, we feel like we have an opportunity to work anywhere we want in the world. We make a choice every day about where we spend our time and where we invest our energy. And... And I'm speaking for myself, and I think for those folks who are kind of at that whiteboard writing those things down, it was about coming up with a set of ideals that would define who we are and who we aspire to be. And that idea of an aspirational set of things that we can strive for, that we can try to become better human beings by virtue of the work that we do, was really at its core. And I think over the years, what's happened with our culture is that it has snowballed, and more people have been attracted to be part of that and have added to it and enhanced it. And now it's turned into something that we routinely think about as our most significant competitive advantage. How do you think that translates into practically how people operate and how people interface with clients? If you don't bring it off the poster on the wall and into your everyday life, it's meaningless. So I think as a starting place, we've always tried to operationalize it. I think that we probably have more people who end up leaving LinkedIn for cultural trespass than for results failure. And, and results, by the way, are not antagonistically opposed to culture. Results are part of our culture. We just put them at the bottom of five tenants because we believe that they're the outflow of other things. And so I don't think there's a, there's a tension between do you shoot for culture or do you shoot for results. I believe that when you have the right culture and you've done the right hiring, people thrive in that environment and the results are the outflow of those cultural practices. Right. I mean, we often talk about within the marketing solutions sales organization that Revenue is the happy byproduct of happy customers, and happy customers are a happy byproduct of happy employees. So um, that is something I, I absolutely live and um, live by every day. Um, so I wanted to turn over to you, John. Um, so as the global brand and external communication lead, you'd recently... Well remembered that. Come yes. <laughs> Snappy. Snappy. Um, so you had recently relaunched the EY brand, um, under the umbrella of building a better working world. Um, and to quote you, actually, you had talked about building a brand from inside out. So just continuing on this theme of purpose-driven brands and how you move that agenda forward by empowering your employees, making that connect connection very clear in your employee base so that that then permeates to the outside world. Take us a little bit into the process that you went through as an organization in terms of how you inculcated that within the organization and how then that translated into a successful brand relaunch. Sure, thanks. Can, can I, um, we heard earlier that Keith Weed said they're the sec second biggest advertiser on the, in the world. And I, I just wonder, does everyone know who you are? Because we're not close to that. 
So, so I've seen one shake. Who, who, who doesn't know what e, who what EY are? Okay, so that's now they formerly known as Ernst and Young. Okay, so a bit like Prince. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, I, I think you know we talked about culture, and I think the original conversation was about purpose. And uh, since joining, you know, I'd read your great book originally, Jim Stengel, about uh, ideal-led brands. I've heard about purpose. When I joined EY, part of the reason was they, they, they'd launched around this purpose, building a better working world. And, you know, the challenge to me was how do you unlock it? How do you give it resonance? And, and, and there was two things. One is I've never spoken more about purpose in my entire career than the last two years. And we did a study with the Oxford Syed Business School that says the conversation around purpose has gone up five times in the last few years. So something's happening out there. And I think EY was pretty... Uh, far-sighted, particularly in the category uh, around loosely called, you know, accountancy firms, management consultancy firms, and, and galvanizing around a purpose. That's the first thing. The second thing I'd say is that in the context of CAN, a lot of the conversation is around purpose-driven brands. And I think where we start the conversation is from a purpose-driven business. And, and I think that's the one bit that I think, having in, in a way gone over to that side of the world from my previous uh, Adman world, is that the power of purpose is around business transformation. You know, we've launched a Beacon Institute around the study of purpose from, from that point of view. And I think, you know, Keith Weed alluded to that, mm -hmm. you know, talking about supply chain re-engineering. So j just one thing I'd say in the conversation is that for us, building a better working world starts as a business driver rather than a kind of brand expression. Right. Uh, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is to, to the point about people is... You know, fundamentally, in many ways, the brief to me from our CEO was, don't worry too much about the external expression of it. Mm. Inspire our... At the time, it was 170,000 people. It's now 230,000 people. In fact, I heard a stat yesterday. It's now 242,000 people. <laughs> um, so, so that was the brief, is how do you inspire people? And that's really what the journey was about, is to say, what does building a better working world mean in the context of our people first, communities, and yes, of course, our clients, uh, but it's that way out. Right. Um, and, and really, you know, the simple answer to the question was created a, a, a galvanizing creative platform around, you know, every single question we help solve for a client moves the working world forward. You know, the better the question, the better the answer, the better the world works. So I think fundamentally, across all of our services, it's about how we solve another problem tomorrow and, you know, with my colleague, uh, Janet, who, you know, who's is in, in the field of helping solve our clients' issues to move their businesses forward, to make that big ripple effect impact in the world. Great. Great. Well, that's a perfect trans transition to uh, Janet, um, who runs the media and entertainment advisory services. And, you know, one of the things that you, I'm sure, find yourself in often is in situations where brands are going through massive transformation, dealing with massive disruption. So how does purposeful brand play a role in terms of how you advise clients to work through that transition, but all the, also build the right kinds of connective tissue between the brand and what they execute? Well, what's interesting to me, just listening uh, to John speak, is what he's talking about with a better working world really does translate to the way we serve our clients. So I transitioned to EY about a year ago from industry where I was in sales and marketing organizations and media and technology. And to me, it was this incredibly exciting moment where the advertising ecosystem really begs for a different level of service. And frankly, the humility that's implied by even the notion of asking better questions. Because in a moment of disruption, the idea that you can approach it with intellectual elitism and say, I've got the right answer, is really hard to believe. And so you have to take this holistic approach. And so um, when we look at it, we think about the marketers, we think about um, the advertising agencies, we think about all the technology and enablers that sit in between the platforms that really enable the future. And because things are being so rapidly disrupted, you have to have humility and you have to be in a position to collaborate and really um, challenge the world we live in in meaningful ways. But to go back to some of the points that were made in the earlier conversation, I think uh, Sir Martin Sorrell, uh, Sir Martin Sorrell and, at Keith Weed really spoke of two really important things, which is 
the notion of building capabilities and the notion of this integrated view. And so you have to take that ecosystem approach. What I love about the work we are doing with the media and entertainment industry is we are doing that heavy lifting because it takes real work to build the connective tissue that, um, that you reference. When I think about um, what, what this world begs for, it begs for integration of thinking and purpose at the core because, for example, in the old world, the C-suite could function as silos. Mm -hmm. A CMO could run the brand, a CRO could run the sales organization and be accountable for revenue, CEO could hold the vision, CFO, on, and on and on. And I don't think the future state um, allows that to continue. And so building connective tissue between that frontline sales organization, the employees who are the beacon of everything that is happening and that un uh, unbelievably critical communication uh, layer of the organization, driving it through across the C-suite and all the way through the organization from customer to employee is just fundamentally important. So it's something we're very focused on. That's great. Um, so I think final question for all three of you actually, in terms of thinking about how we put all of these great ideas into action. In terms of activation of, of that connective tissue, um, what are some of the key things that you think about in terms of how to make these, this vision really into very actionable, practical things for the workforce? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, you know, fundamentally, go, going back into the inside, I think it's very tangible. For us, we've got a number of initiatives. So, you know, from an, uh, an engagement point of view, we've launched one of the biggest employee engagement programs around Better Begins With You, which rewards our people for solving very complex issues across a range of issues. So that's, that's one tangible. We've launched things like Women Fast Forward. We have a big program around accelerating women. So it plays out in a number of tangible initiatives. You know, from, a, from an externalization of that, from an activation point of view, you, you know, it's, it's, as Keith said, it's a complex world of choices to get your message out there. And I think one, I would say, a clear, creative platform helps. I think that's something, you know, I think we've, we've created. And secondarily, is making active choices. And, you know, it'd be remiss of me not to be at a LinkedIn event to say, you know, LinkedIn is, is a primary tool for us in connecting our message because what it allows us to do is not just from a targeting point of view but also from a conversational point of view throw out questions and we get live dialogue I mean it's incredible the power of the data we get back we know which question is, is exciting enticing people we know which question we might have got wrong and then it's leading to a powerful engagement so we see that you know LinkedIn but you know quick plug posters also work right and and, and it's about making the active choices to create a common creative platform that engages. So. I, I would say that in terms of activating it, you know, it may sound cliche to talk about people, process, and systems as, as the fundamental glue, but I do think those really sit at the heart of it. I think that for, for at this moment, though, really challenging the way you build culture, the way you look at talent and look at that people issue, the way you think about how you operate as an organization, the way you collaborate, the way you build connective tissue between all the layers of the organization to really activate the intelligence that sits at every node of any of the companies in which we work. And then to really look at platforms as an enabler because technology is obviously transforming everything that we do. And it's not about a digital strategy any longer, it's about a business strategy um, in a digital world. And so for us, I think uh, looking at those platforms and how you can aggressively challenge it. But the headline I would say above all is incrementalism will not get us there. So we have to think in really leaps and bounds in very different ways. And I think what I would, what I would say is probably three things. So I think you need a, a framework, a message, and then consistent action. So for example, for us, a framework would be a leader's responsibility relative to culture is to set the example, to demonstrate the example, and to hold others accountable to that example. How can your people understand what they should do unless your leader makes it very clear and then through her action shows that all the time and then hold others accountable so that an inaction can't be tacitly misunderstood as being acceptable. So that's the framework. Set the standard, demonstrate the standard, hold others accountable to the standard. Then the message has to be precise and has to touch your people. So for us, our first cultural tenet is about transformation. We believe in transformation of the world through our platform, transformation of our company through our employees' actions, where you are held accountable to make a difference. You want to see your footsteps in the sand, that you've been here, and that we're different because of you. And then lastly, it's the promise to that employee of transformation of self. 
that you will spend some period of years with LinkedIn, and we have all the profile data in the world, so we know you're going to leave. Let's own that truth together. And whether it's two years or five years or 10 years, when you leave, you will have a transformed career trajectory by virtue of what happened here together. The exposure to the ideas, the opportunities, the people, the frameworks, you will be better, you will live better because of that. And then the consistent action, you have to live this stuff every day. You know, in my conversations with incoming candidates, I talk about before they've ever joined that they're going to leave one day. I say the same thing to them I just said to you. When they come here and they work with us, I reinforce this with them. I draw a picture on the whiteboard, I make them a promise, a personal promise, and ask to be held accountable to this. And then all of our leaders live this every day. Cheers to that. And thank you, Mike, John, and Janet. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys.